Hi everyone, welcome back to Reading with Raptors on this kind of rainy Tuesday morning here in Minnesota. Um, today I am joined by Nero, our resident turkey vulture. Uh, I'm gonna actually give him right away. We're a little bit restless this morning, so I have a paper towel tube with a little rat leg poking out. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of put that over there and see if he's <laughs> interested in uh, interacting with that right away here. There's a lot of uh, interesting things to explore in this room right now, I think, that he's interested in looking at. Um, so we were <laughs> a little bit restless. So you can see him right away um, using that very skilled beak to kind of poke in there and hopefully be able to take that piece of rat out, um, just like he would if he were a wild turkey vulture out um, scavenging out in the wild, he'd be able to stick his head inside of all sorts of dead carcasses to get out all of that really good meat. So he's gonna work on that for a little bit. Today, fittingly, I have with me a book called Vulture View. I'll see if I can scooch, maybe I can, maybe before we get going, I'll adjust just a little bit so I'm not totally covering him up. We have Vulture View by April Pulisare with illustrations by Steve Jenkins. Maybe I'll relocate slightly before we really get going. I really want you to be able to see him. Okay, there we go. Um, so these illustrations are really exciting because they are all made from cut paper, which I think is very cool. So you can see all these details right away on this vulture. So we're gonna be learning about turkey vultures. And he didn't actually take that piece of rat out of that paper towel tube, so we'll see if he comes back for it. But I'll, I'll try to uh, adjust accordingly so you can see him work on that. I also have um, a couple of other enrichment items for him. I have uh, a paper bag, like a grocery bag. I have another paper towel tube. I have some egg cartons, um, some other bits of rat. So we'll see if he's interested in eating a little bit later on. But for now, we're gonna begin with Vulture View. This illustration here. He's gonna keep on kind of exploring, I think, in the background. So this is Vulture View. The sun is rising up, up. It heats the air, up, up. Let's see these vultures in the morning air. Wings stretch wide to catch a ride on warming air. Going where? You can see that turkey vulture's big long wings. Up, up! Turkey vultures tilt, soar, scan to find the food that vultures can eat. There are turkey vultures turkey vulture wandering closer. That snake over there? No, no. That fox over there? No, no. See the snake and the fox? That bear over there? No, no. Vultures smell the air. They sniff, search, seek for foods that... reek. I love the texture they got on the kind of rotting fur and skin of this. Looks like some sort of cow. <laughs> they look for foods that reek. Hello. Those fragrant flowers? No, no. That spicy smoke? No, no. That stinky dead deer? Yes, yes. See the turkey vultures coming into land? Vultures like a mess. They land and dine. Rotten is fine see all these turkey vultures coming into land to eat this what we call a carcass or a dead animal. I just love the patterns that they got with the cut paper for their little wrinkly heads. Mm. 
they eat, they then clean. Splash, dry, preen. Preening turkey vulture. They hop, flap, soar to look for more. All afternoon, but soon. But soon, the sun starts to sink. Down, down, the air starts to cool. Down, down, wings glide, wings ride through cooling air. Going where? Going down, down, down. The vultures gather in vulture trees, settle and sleep like families. You can see them all in this big tree. Until the morning sun rises. Up, up, it heats the air. Up, up, wings stretch wide to catch a ride on warming air. Going where? Up, up. See the turkey vulture? So I love this book because it has this great um, connection with the time of day and the warming of those thermals. There's a little bit more information that they've provided in the back of this book about get to know vultures. Soaring up, up, up. Turkey vultures, which hold their wings in a distinctive V shape, are among the most graceful soaring birds on earth. When the sun heats air near the ground, this warm air rises in pockets called thermals. Vultures hop, leap, flap, then stretch out their wings like sails, allowing the rising air to help lift them as they spiral upward. Then they soar. Thermals form over fields, grasslands, cities, and even parking lots. As thermals rise, they can slide up hillsides. So you may see vultures rising along hillsides lofted by warm air. Turkey vultures also get lift by taking advantage of wind that blows towards the hillside, then is deflected upward by the sloped ground. As the sun sets, air cools and sinks. Breezes pick up, break up thermals, excuse me, breezes break up thermals and make it difficult for vultures to maintain altitude. They settle in for the night they sleep together in groups of 10 or more. The vulture family. Turkey vultures, or their scientific name, Cathartes ara, belong to the family Cathartidae, which has seven species, including the black vulture and California condor. Adult turkey vultures have red faces, while immature ones have gray faces. Vultures in general have very few feathers on their faces, heads, or necks. Scientists believe this has to do with what they eat. When a vulture pokes its head neck deep into a carcass, it can get messy. Feathers would be hard to clean. They're nature's cleanup crew. Unlike hawks and owls, turkey vultures have weak claws or talons that are not suited for killing animals. Turkey vultures are scavengers. They eat carrion, dead animals that have been killed by accidents, diseases, or predators. As vultures eat, they break apart carcasses into smaller pieces. These smaller pieces can be more easily scavenged by mice, beetles, fly larvae, or worms. The rest of the carcass is decomposed by single-celled organisms and ultimately becomes part of the soil. Turkey vultures find food by sight and smell. They can safely eat rotten food that would make a human sick. Scientists aren't sure entirely how, but the vulture's body sterilizes the food, killing off dangerous organisms. Although vultures are attracted to messy food, the birds themselves are very clean. They bathe and preen regularly to keep themselves tidy. A few more notes on their family life and range. Here, I'll turn a little bit so you can see the text is probably pretty small, so that way you can see Nero. Family life and range. Turkey vultures nest in caves, cliffs, 
hollow trees, and abandoned buildings. They usually lay one to three eggs. Both the male and female take turns keeping the eggs warm and later feed the young. Nine or so weeks after hatching, the young leave the nest to test their skills in the air. In summer, these birds range from southern Canada through most of the continental United States. Many of them migrate to South America for the winter. Unlike California condors, which are endangered, turkey vultures are increasing in number and are expanding their range northward, perhaps as a result of global climate change. Heads up, young scientists. Not much is known about the biology of turkey vultures. There isn't a great deal of information about how they communicate with one another or what their lives are like during the winter. All this and more needs scientific study. So there's still a lot of research for all of us to do on turkey vultures. I'll show you here, I'll turn this a little bit. Sorry about my hand. So you can see Nero hanging out over there. I don't think he ever fully ate this piece of rat, but I have it kind of in here to kind of mimic that kind of head motion that he would need to do to scavenge a carcass out in the wild. So we'll see, maybe if it's moved a little bit. Otherwise I have a couple of other interesting toys. There's also um, all sorts of fun kind of cabinets and a door to another room over here that I might be kind of looking at right now. Let's see if people had any questions that came up. I do have another book that's um, about California condors that we might read if we have lots of time. Ooh, question from Felix. How do baby vultures grow? Oh, really good question. So like all birds, and like a lot of our raptors, baby vultures grow up really fast. So they hatch from an egg about the size of a chicken egg that you might get at the store or from your own chickens. So they hatch out of an egg around that size and they grow up to be full grown size with that full five and a half to six foot wingspan. They do all of that growing in about two months. So they grow up really fast. Turkey vultures are normally nesting inside of kind of holes. They like to be in kind of nice enclosed places. So a lot of times you'll find turkey vulture nests on kind of worn away river bluffs and cliffs. You might find them underneath maybe a tree that's kind of fallen over. So it's got that nice cave like area underneath its exposed roots. So you'll oftentimes find turkey vultures nesting in places like that. Um, or other, they might also nest on top of kind of human-made structures like buildings, places like that. Anywhere that has that nice kind of enclosed feeling so they can feel nice and safe. So that's where those babies are growing up and they're growing so fast. So their parents are bringing them food um, to eat that whole time. So they're eating meat from their first meal. So they're able to get a lot of good protein and energy to fuel all that really fast growing up. They start off all very fuzzy with little white fuzzy feathers. I know we have a couple of pictures in our archives. Maybe we can post one of them. Um, but they start off with all really kind of fuzzy, soft white feathers. And they really quickly start growing in those really nice kind of glossy dark feathers that turkey vultures are really known for. Like the book said, um, they start off with kind of a gray face. So the first year those babies have that kind of gray face. And then as they become adults over the next year, they get this nice kind of pink face too. And the amount of pink can kind of change. <laughs> the amount of pink can kind of change depending on uh, what's going on with the turkey vulture. So they can flush their faces really bright red and they can also, um, kind of depending on where they're kind of moving their blood around, they can also get really pale too. So it kind of depends on what's going on with them. It's maybe one of the ways that they might communicate um, with other turkey vultures. So really good questions. That's a lot about how tur baby turkey vultures grow. Let's see if I missed any other questions. Oh, somebody was saying that they love seeing turkey vultures in the breeding season. So I was, I was inspired to talk about turkey vultures this week because I just saw my first turkey vultures of the spring uh, this last week. I hadn't seen any yet. I know they've been seeing some up um, at Hawk Ridge in Duluth as they're migrating further north, but I hadn't actually seen any of them myself until about this last week. 
It's lovely now with these really nice warm days that we're having and supposed to keep on having. Um, we'll see lots more turkey vultures around. So they're all getting back to Minnesota now. Um, anyone watching from further south in the country might have been seeing them already for a few weeks. Um, but up here in Minnesota, it's been a little bit chilly. So it's been a little bit hard to have turkey vultures up here. Usually once it gets above freezing, it's usually when we see them. So I've been really excited to see them. So keep eyes out if you haven't seen any yet so far this year. Um, hopefully you'll see some soon. You have some people talking about their sense of smell also. So as Nero moves around, maybe I'll, I'll do a little bit more of a close up in a little bit. But you can actually see where his nostrils are. So these birds have this really long, <laughs> these really long faces. And so where their nostrils are, instead of the two tiny little nostrils that most other birds have, they have these really large nostrils um, that you can actually see through. Um, I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll try to get a closer up here in a little bit. Um, but you can actually see right through them and that really allows them to take in really nice, good gulping sniffs of air so that they can smell that rotting meat from really far away. It's thought to be as far as a few miles away. So if you find any sort of rotting carcass, a lot of times you'll see turkey vultures start appearing just out of nowhere from miles away, all soaring in on those nice long wings, looking for that dead animal to eat. Ooh, somebody asking one of my favorite questions. What is the difference between what we call old world and new world? turkey vultures, or uh, excuse me, old world and new world vultures. So the terms old world and new world are often used in kind of biology in general to describe the difference between um, what we call the old world or Europe, Asia, and Africa, that kind of general region, and, and the difference between kind of North Central and South America that we call the new world. Um, there's a big ocean or two big oceans between those two kind of major sets of continents. So um, usually we see some pretty big differences between the animals that live in those two general regions. So here in North, Central, and South America, we have what we call the New World vultures, which are our turkey vultures, our black vultures, our greater and lesser head, greater yellow-headed vultures, excuse me, which if you're unfamiliar, because they're usually far down in kind of the southern part of the continents, um, they look very similar to turkey vultures. They're in the same kind of their cousins, but they have these really interesting kind of rainbow faces. So they have yellow, they also have some green and purple kind of mixed in on their skin. It's really gorgeous. Um, so definitely a bird to look up, the greater and lesser yellow-headed vultures. We also have our condors. So our California condors, our Andean condors, as well as our king vultures. Um, so we have a lot of different kinds of these, what we call our new world vultures. And the difference between them and what we often think of if you've seen, or maybe you've been to um, places like the Serengeti of Africa, or you've seen documentaries where you've seen them, they have um, vultures there too that look a lot like the vultures that we have here, even though they're not really that closely related. They're very, very, very distant cousins. So a lot of the similarities that they have are that vultures around the world tend to have either very short feathers on their heads or they have no feathers on their heads. Um, and that helps when they are digging their heads inside of carcasses. You don't want really long, uh, fluffy feathers on your head if you're gonna be sticking them inside of a dead deer. They're gonna get all messy. It gets hard to clean that off. So usually vultures have really, really short feathers, so that way they're, it's easier for that kind of gunk to all come off. So we have a lot of similarities with our vultures. Um, they also tend to have the really big, long wings for gliding and soaring, looking for dead animals. So they fill what we call an ecological niche, which basically means that out in the environment, they have really similar jobs. They're our cleanup crew, they're our scavengers. Some differences are that our uh, new world vultures, our vultures that we have here in North Central and South America, like our turkey vultures, um, they don't have very powerful flight muscles. Um, they actually have, um, compared to other birds, they're not very good at taking off, so they do a lot of gliding. Their feet are even kind of less strong at gripping things, like those vultures that you might see in Europe and Asia and Africa. Um, they also, a couple of our vultures here in North America, have that wonderful sense of smell, like our turkey vulture and our uh, yellow-headed vultures. 
Um, they also, one of my favorite things, because you, you might hear a little bit of this, they actually aren't able to make vocalizations or those kind of singing sounds or screaming sounds that you might hear from other raptors. They don't actually have the ability to make those kinds of sounds. So the only sounds that you'll hear from our vultures here in North Central and South America are kind of hisses and grunting noises. So they can't actually make a lot of noise, which I think is very interesting. They're very interesting differences. My other favorite difference is that our New World vultures do something called urohydrosis. What could that mean? Urohydrosis means that our vultures here, if they need to cool themselves off, they will actually release their waste onto their own legs. Now, why would they want to do that? It acts a lot like when we as mammals, when we sweat, it evaporates into the air and that cools us off. When turkey vultures, for example, use urohydrosis or when they eliminate their waste or what we might call muting onto their own legs, it will evaporate and it will cool them off. So you can actually see sometimes on turkey vultures, their legs kind of have this kind of almost chalky looking white on them. And that is because they have probably been cooling themselves off by releasing their uh, kind of bird equivalent of urine onto their legs and helps cool them off. Might sound a little bit gross to us because that's not how we do things, but it's a really clever way of figuring out a very important problem, which is how to keep cool if you're a very dark colored bird spending a lot of time sunning yourself in these very warm summer temperatures, they're gonna need to cool off. So turkey vultures and our other New World vultures have some very important adaptations to living here in North, uh, Central and South America. It's a great question. Uh, Kai wants to know, why do they like rotten food? It's actually very interesting. So for turkey vultures especially, because they have such a good sense of smell, it's easier to find. If you think of things that have died, are they able to run around very fast? No, right? They can't really move at all. So it can be kind of hard to find things that have died that are just kind of sitting there. But if you're a turkey vulture, if you wait a little bit and things start to get a little bit smelly, they're able to, oh, excellent. They're able to smell where that food is. And that takes a little bit of rotting. It doesn't need to be really rotting. It doesn't need to be too far along. It just needs to be just broken down enough by bacteria um, that it starts releasing a particular chemical into the air, that kind of smell, that really classic rotten food smell. That's the thing that they're smelling for. So that is why turkey vultures usually find things that are getting a little bit rotten, that have already died. It's great, it's a great source of food. If you're a turkey vulture, it means you don't have to worry about hunting down a live animal. It's already dead. It's not going to hurt you. You don't have to chase it down. It's just kind of sitting there. So it's a great source of food if you are an animal who is adapted to eat that kind of thing. It works out really well. Looking for um, some other, oh, where do they migrate from? So most of the turkey vultures that are getting back here to Minnesota and kind of Southern Canada, um, they were mostly spending their time down in the southern United States, uh, maybe Central America. A lot of our turkey vultures will actually migrate all the way down to South America as well. So they'll be down there acting as scavengers uh, way farther south where it's very warm all winter long. The problem here in Minnesota, especially in kind of the upper Midwest, is it gets really cold. It gets really cold and really snowy. So it's going to be really hard to find food. And if you look at his head, he's got those really short feathers. He also has pretty featherless legs. It doesn't have a lot of feathers down there. So it'd be kind of like trying to live here in Minnesota with no snow pants and no boots and no winter hat. So it'd be really hard for them to survive here all winter long. So head down further south where it's a little bit warmer. They can stay down there all winter long and then come back up here when it's nice and we have all sorts of dead animals for them to eat up here all spring, summer, and fall long. Oh, some people also seeing turkey vultures this weekend. That's awesome. It's been so warm out. Uh, wonderful thermals out there for them to be soaring on. Uh, oh, what is he named after? Um, we don't know exactly. So a little bit of history on this particular turkey vulture, because um, he's 
got uh, a bit of a following because this turkey vulture is 46 years old this year. Um, so he is one of the oldest turkey vultures living in captivity that we know of. Um, so he's 46 years old this year, which is pretty impressive. So he was originally taken um, as part of a, a very important study being done um, here in the upper Midwest, but it was being done on California condors, which are usually they're native down to kind of the, the southwestern part of the United States. Um, kind of near Utah, Arizona, Southern California. And so um, the problem was, so back in the 1970s when, <laughs> when Nero was hatched, um, we had a really big problem with our California condors. There were very few of them left in the world. There were only about 20 to 30, some estimates might put them at 40, but a very small number of California condors around that time. And they needed to figure out um, a way to be able to track these California condors. What they were doing at the time was bringing all of the ones that they could find into captivity. They brought them to a zoo um, so that they could work on breeding them in captivity and releasing them. Since we just were not able to keep up with the numbers that they were losing, California condors um, breed very slowly. They might not lay eggs every year, and if they do, they only lay one every year. Um, so it usually is a pretty long time to get new California condors out into the wild. So they brought all of them into captivity to help keep them safe um, and help breed new California condors to release. But they needed a way to track these condors once they were released back out to the wild. And since we were just talking about urohydrosis or kind of muting or eliminating waste onto their own legs, you'll know that we can't really ban our vultures the same way that we would other birds. A lot of people might be familiar with how we band or put kind of a metal or plastic band on the leg of a bird if we are releasing it. And that way we can track where those birds go and where they end up. It's been a really big source of information for scientists tracking migrating birds of all different kinds, songbirds, waterfowl, all sorts of birds, right? But it doesn't work for vultures because if they're gonna eliminate waste onto their own legs, they might actually cause an infection, they might ruin the band that we put on them. There are a lot of reasons why you can't actually do that. So you're not allowed to do that and it wouldn't work anyway. So they had to figure out a way to track these California condors. So instead of trying it out on some of these very highly endangered California condors, um, some researchers up here in the upper Midwest took a group of turkey vultures who have a very similar flight and hunting style. They're just about half the size of a California condor, so a lot more manageable as well. And so they took a few of these turkey vultures, like Nero here, intentionally raised them by people, so they are what's called a human imprint, is they don't really know how to be a turkey vulture out in the wild. But using this group of turkey vultures, they were able to test out a few different ways of tracking these California condors. So now, if you ever see a picture of a California condor, almost all of them have a band kind of up on their wing. It's um, kind of in the, there's a kind of patch of skin that goes between kind of their equivalent of your kind of main bulk of your arm and your kind of forearm. There's a band of skin here that has feathers on it. So there's a little band that goes right there. So it's a big colored band. Um, it looks like a little square with a certain color and a certain number on it. And that way we can track California condors safely um, from a great distance as well. So that way we're able to help out those California condors. It does mean that Nero here um, was going to live his life in captivity after being raised by people for that study. So it did a really, really important piece of work. Um, it has been teaching people ever since. So he's had quite a long history of teaching people um, both at the Carpenter Nature Center and here at the Raptor Center for quite a long time. Um, so why exactly they named him Nero, I don't know. I know that it is a name of a Roman emperor who's fairly famous or infamous, I might say. Um, so that'd be a historical name, but I don't know exactly why they called him Nero. That would be a good question for them, but it's quite a long time ago. Uh, oh, oh, someone asking a very good and very uh, timely question. With fewer road kills out there, potentially because fewer people are out driving around, there might be less food. How might that affect them? Uh, I don't know if we're quite sure. It's going to be really interesting kind of this whole spring um, with that kind of similar phenomenon we've been, um, some people have been thinking that that might be affecting some um, of our local bald eagles as well because they are also scavengers. So I'm actually really interested to see what happens. Um, they certainly are very good at finding those uh, dead animals and they're able to kind of search from a really long distance. So I think of all the animals who are going to rely on those carcasses, turkey vultures are in a pretty good spot. 
um, just because they are able to find food from such a far distance and they're able to kind of sniff around for not just those big dead deer or raccoons or things like that, but they can find those smaller animals as well. So they've got, they've got a few options. But yeah, I don't know if we're quite sure. I'm very interested to find out. This is going to be uh, quite an interesting year. I know for a lot of reasons. Um, but certainly from a, um, a naturalist perspective on what maybe fewer roads, uh, fewer cars on the road might mean for some of our local scavengers. It's going to be really interesting. Seeing if we have other um, questions. Um, do they have one made for life? That's a really good question. It comes up a lot um, with our raptors in general. So in general, raptors, kind of across the board, um, they'll usually mate with the same kind of partner for years in a row, right? The, but usually what's happening is they're both coming back to the same nest site that they've had a lot of luck at before, the kind of same area that they're familiar with. Um, if they left, some of our non-migratory birds will stay in the same kind of area all year round. But for our migratory birds, They'll usually come back to the same kind of general area, either where they were hatched um, or where they've had a lot of luck raising chicks in previous years. So usually what'll happen is usually it's the same two come back to the same spot, but if one of them doesn't come back one year, it's not a big deal. There are others, there are other potential mates out there. Um, so usually, yes, they'll mate with the same kind of partner for years in a row, but if something happens and one of them doesn't come back or maybe they have a, a year or two that just doesn't really work out, um, they usually don't seem to have much of a problem with finding a different partner um, so that they can keep on having successful nests. So yeah, really good question. It's a little bit, a little bit complicated. Yeah, so really good questions. Yeah, some people recognizing um, Nero from quite a while ago, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, he has been a, a definite big figure here at the Raptor Center. Um, he and the Raptor Center are actually the same age, both 46 years old. Um, founded in 1974 is also when he was hatched. <laughs> ah, lots of really good, um, yeah, lots of really good <laughs> questions about Nero. I do have a bath pan. I see a question about, is he going to take a bath? I do have a water pan. I will say that this particular turkey vulture, I know that a lot of turkey vultures out in the wild take quite a lot of baths and take a lot of good care of their feathers. He also takes great care of his feathers and does a lot of preening. Doesn't seem to be as interested in baths. I'll sometimes catch him taking a bath out in his kind of main front display, but usually I'll offer him a water pan in this kind of situation and eh, he might use it, he might not. Usually not. Sometimes if I put a kind of floating dog toy in there, he'll go in there to fish it out. Um, but usually he's not very interested in taking a bath. Usually on certain occasions. I think right now he's maybe too interested in kind of exploring around. <laughs> oh, somebody was asking me, I get to tell you another one of my favorite fun facts about birds here in North America. Somebody was asking if we know the date of his birthday, so the month and the day. And I don't know if we know that, but I will say, that we have established that for every bird in North America, so that we can keep track, so scientists across the board can keep track of how old birds are, every bird in North America turns one year older on January 1st, so New Year's Day. So we're a little bit late now, but next to New Year's Day, you know you can go outside and you can wish all of the birds that you're seeing a very happy hatch day. Um, most of them probably hatched later in the year as we get into the spring and the summer, but just because we don't know for sure, it was just established that January 1st, we'll just say that everyone turns a year older. So that is the kind of relevant date that we use here at the Raptor Center for keeping track of how old all of the birds are. So really good question. We don't know, but January 1st works just fine. Uh, oh, do the females look the same? Yes, yeah, so I've been referring to um, Nero as being male. Um, and that's mostly just based off of his general size. Um, we're able to weigh him every day. So we know that he's um, kind of on the smaller end for most of our kind of turkey vultures in this region, kind of the Northern North America region. Our turkey vultures tend to be larger, need to keep a little bit warmer when they are here um, on those cooler nights. Um, lots of very large animals for them to eat as well to kind of fuel that larger size. So he usually comes in at weighing about four, four and a half pounds or so with that nice kind of five and a half foot wingspan. Uh, the females tend to be a little bit larger, a little bit closer to six foot wingspan, maybe closer to about five or a little bit more pounds. 
So other than that though, the males and the females, or the boys and the girls, tend to look the same. They both have these really nice kind of iridescent or shiny um, kind of dark feathers that um, you can kind of see there's like a little rainbow effect to them when they're in bright lights. Um, always really hard when we're in a room like this to see, but um, if you're ever, ever able to see um, some turkey vultures out sunning in the wild with a pair of binoculars, you can see, especially like along the sides of their wings and on their backs, they have these lovely kind of shiny feathers. Um, they all have the same kind of red heads, um, same kind of pinkish legs. So yeah, usually look about the same. Usually can't tell too much of a difference unless you're able to put them on a scale and weigh them. It can be a little bit tricky. It is quite a large wingspan, absolutely. Let's see if you have any more questions. Otherwise, I do have... He also doesn't seem very interested in the rat leg, but I have some of his favorite food, which is I have this nice rat, I have a nice kind of rat chunk, and I have some nice little pieces of organ meat, which is usually a big hit. So I'm gonna give him some of that and see if he's a little bit more interested. Um, if he's a little bit more interested in maybe playing with some of this, <laughs> investigating a little bit. We have some nice egg cartons that people have been, uh, that we have a nice cache of from people bringing in. So what I'll do is see if I can move this down here a little bit closer. Sorry about the shaky camera for a second. I'm just gonna collapse this down a little bit so we're a little bit closer in while he's working on that. Just trying to make sure it doesn't fall over. <laughs> there we go. I get a nice view. You might also be able to see that um, we call it a perforate nostril or uh, that nose that you can really just see right through um, <laughs> and he has this very long beak so it's curved and sharp just like all other raptor beaks are um, but it's very kind of a long narrow face so when he eats pieces of food he's usually taking what looks like little nibbles of food so he's not taking the huge big chunks and swallowing them down like you might see with um, like last week we saw with our bald eagle guest um, he's usually taking little tiny nibbles even though he's got, he's a decently large size, he takes really small bites with that clever little beak. So he's able to um, kind of pick up food. Might be coming over to investigate. <laughs> I'll stay out of his way. Trying to track here, there we go. So nice little close up here. You can see on his head, um, he doesn't have no feathers. They're really, really short feathers. Um, it kind of looks like um, like dusty or like almost velvety. Um, so there's like really, really kind of short little bristly feathers that he has on his head and on his neck. Um, so that way he can keep a little bit warm. He's got a little bit of decoration there, um, but he's able to um, keep his head really nice and clean. So when you see turkey vultures kind of basking in the sun, they're able to kind of bake any of the leftover bits of food that might have gotten stuck on their heads when they were sticking them inside of carcasses. Doing that very, very important work. You'll be able to see a little bit. Oh, it's so hard with this lighting, that iridescence, but I think somebody had asked about um, my favorite things about vultures. Um, I have a lot of really cool things that I love about vultures, but specifically turkey vultures, I just really enjoy that kind of iridescence that they have on their feathers. Uh, I think it's really, really cool um, just to be able to see it kind of change in the different light. My other favorite thing, maybe I can try to find a picture to post up later, um, but the feathers on his neck, he can actually kind of pull kind of maneuver his neck skin and those feathers to kind of pull them up. So right now you can see kind of the whole round skull and a little bit of his neck, but he can actually kind of maneuver those feathers so they're kind of up, really close up. It kind of looks like if you are wearing a sweatshirt and you pull the hood up a little bit, kind of looks like that. So he can actually keep his head and neck warm uh, when it gets a little bit cool at night. He can kind of put those feathers up um, to be able to keep his head a little bit warmer. See if I can, I don't know if I can lower this too much more. Hopefully you can see him pretty well. Why does he have pink 
feet? That is a really good question. Um, normally the colors in their feet, so when you see birds that have the really bright yellow feet or orange feet or really dark brown or black feet, um, those colors are usually um, kind of built in to the keratin, those nice kind of scales that they have on their legs. Whereas turkey vultures, um, I think it's more that they don't have really kind of intense coloring. And a lot of the kind of pink and the red that you see on their bodies um, is kind of like um, kind of like when people blush, where we kind of have the blood kind of close to the surface of our cheeks and it makes us look kind of bright red. So um, usually you'll see his um, the colors on his legs as well as his head, and there's also a little patch that he'll sometimes show on his chest um, where he'll kind of part those feathers um, that will get really, really bright red, or they might get kind of pale, kind of almost gray in color. So I think it kind of depends on what's going on with him. This is the pretty normal, typical um, kind of colors that you'll see, that kind of pink color, um, but it can get very bright red. Uh, you'll oftentimes see that too with um, when turkey vultures are displaying. And maybe part of it has to do with the fact that they're not able to make vocalizations. Like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of research to still be done on turkey vulture behavior. Um, but maybe because they're not able to vocalize as much, um, it seems to be a way that they communicate with each other. So for a lot of times, part of their mating display involves showing this big bright chest, uh, big bright kind of red patch of skin that they have on their chests underneath their feathers, and then kind of making their heads look really, really bright red so it seems to maybe have, maybe have some sort of role in communication too. How do they clean their beak and head off after eating? Oh, such a good question. So um, there are some vultures in the world who tend to hang out in big groups. Um, famously, if we have anyone watching from the southern kind of part of the US and Central America, we have um, our black vultures that live down there. Um, but we don't really have them up here. So if you are, aren't familiar, but we have some our black vultures, which are called gregarious, which means that they like to hang out in groups. You'll sometimes see them preen each other. So if you can't do it yourself, you can ask a friend for a helping hand. But our turkey vultures tend to be a little bit more solitary. They'll roost in groups, um, but they don't usually spend too much time preening or things like that. So how they clean off their own heads is they'll usually find some sort of surface to um, rub it on. You can actually hear a little bit of that grunting noise. I don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up. Um, <laughs> Um, but you'll see them rubbing their beaks on objects, so branches, rocks, things like that. We talked about last week called beaking, where it's helping to clean off their beaks and sharpen them as well. Um, but they'll also spend a lot of time kind of preening their feathers and cleaning off their heads. Relocate myself slightly here. So a little bit of this is actually a little bit of the um, behavior that you might see in the springtime with our turkey vultures. You can see maybe a little bit. I'll see if I can move this. You can see a little bit of that little patch on his chest. So because uh, this particular turkey vulture is what we call a human imprint, um, doesn't really know how to interact with other turkey vultures and maybe more importantly, doesn't really know how to interact with humans. So normally a turkey vulture wouldn't really be too interested in a person, um, but since Nero was raised by people, doesn't really understand that, hey, I should kind of mind my own business. So sometimes here in the springtime, um, we'll see a little bit of this displaying out of him um, for the people who work with him a lot that he's quite seemingly comfortable around. But here, I'll be quiet for a second and see if you can hear those little noises. And of course he stops as soon as I stop talking. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to be quiet for a minute if he starts making them again. Keep it quiet. So normally how birds make noise is they have an organ called a syrinx. Um, instead of the larynx or kind of voice box that humans have that we're pretty familiar with. So... Um, <laughs> Um, so turkey vultures and our other New World vultures don't actually have that organ. So how normally a syrinx works... I'll sit behind the camera again. So normally how a syrinx works is it works kind of the same way as if you ever blow up a balloon and then kind of let it deflate. If you kind of uh, make the opening of the balloon kind of wider and narrower, you can make it make all sort of fun kind of whistling noises. 
Um, and that's kind of how a Syrinx works. It's like a very, very, very complicated version of air going out of a balloon and making those squeaking noises. So that's normally how birds make noise. But since turkey vultures don't actually have that, they don't have that ability. So that's why the only noises that he's really making are those kind of grunts. They can also make some hissing noises. Um, mostly just the kind of way that they're, he's kind of exhaling that air is what's making those noises. So I'll see if we have a couple few questions. I'm kind of awkwardly perched behind the camera here, so I'm not um, too close to him. What is the little hole under his eyes? Oh, kind of near the back? Oh, really, really good eye. Um, so that little hole that's kind of, um, kind of a little bit back on his head and kind of underneath his eyes, those are the holes for his ears. So that actually is what most birds' ears look like, is they're just little holes on the sides of their head. And normally those are all covered up by feathers. So right now they're kind of blending in with the little wrinkles of skin that he has on his head. Um, but here, I can move back now, I think. <laughs> um, so normally they're blending in with um, those feathers that they have. Pretty famously for owls, those holes are actually huge on the sides of their heads, and they have those big facial discs to kind of funnel sound into them. Um, but yeah, that's normally about the size that most uh, birds' ears are, just a little hole on the side of their head. Yeah, really nice catch. That's a really good eye that you have there. Fantastic. Well, I think we will um, wrap up here for today. Thank you so much for joining me and Nero, our resident turkey vulture here at the Raptor Center for Reading with Raptors. Um, I hope you're all staying, um, <laughs> staying uh, safe and healthy out there. Um, keep an eye out for all those birds coming through. Like I said, turkey vultures are hopefully going to be here in full force before we know it, now that we're getting into May already. I do also have one quick note. Um, I want to wish a very happy hatch day to Lila, who turned six yesterday. Um, I know a lot of us with spring birthdays um, are finding new and interesting ways to celebrate. So I hope you had a very happy day, Lila. Um, happy, happy sixth hatch day. Um, so otherwise, folks, we're going to sign off here. I'll see if I can find a picture of that baby turkey vulture to post, because I know we have one somewhere. And I'd hate for you to miss out on that, because they're, they're pretty fluffy. So thank you all so much again, and we'll see you next week for another uh, session of Reading with Raptors. Have a good week. <laughs>